Hey everybody, it's Spooky from Armored Talk, and welcome to an interview between senior producer Josh Morse from My.com and the lead developer from Obsidian, Richard Taylor. The interview actually took place at the Obsidian headquarters in Irvine, California, about the same time that the three-part developer question and answer video series that was posted last week because some of those questions were exclusively from Armor Talk. I had access to a lot of the raw footage they shot that day. One of the interviews they conducted is actually the one you're about ready to watch. The Armored Warfare portal today just posted a few bullet points from this interview, but I thought it might be interesting for everybody to see the interview in its entirety, and that's what I have for you here today. Josh is the person on the left and is Jinx in the forums, and most people realize he's a senior producer of Armored Warfare. He is asking Rich, who is Red Fox in the forums, a lot of questions that were submitted by fans. And Rich is, of course, the lead developer or project director for Armored Warfare from Obsidian. I'll go ahead and get out of your way and let you watch the video. Hope you enjoy. Hi, my name is Joshua Morris, and I am senior producer at My.com, and I'm here to interview Rich Taylor, project director on... Armored Warfare, working at Obsidian. So first off, uh, Rich, uh, tell me a story about how a development studio uh, known for making AAA RPGs gets to make a tank game. <laughs> well, when we started Armored Warfare, uh, we had already been looking into kind of branching out into other markets from just the traditional uh, $60 range RPGs that we've been making for since Obsidian was founded. Uh, you can see evidence of that in our other projects as well. You know, we had Project Eternity, a Kickstarter game, and other opportunities we've explored that are a little different than what we had been making. We just felt that it was time to adjust with the change of the market, the change of the console generations, and things like that, to work on something different that we hadn't done before. And it is just you know trying to grow with the times and explore different options. We really saw that that the way players are getting engaged in games is has changed over the years, and we wanted to be a part of that. So we had been working and exploring different free-to-play options for a number of months prior to uh, exploring Armored Warfare as a possible opportunity. And so when that when the, the chance came to, to really dig into something like that, we jumped on it right away with a small core group of excited developers that were really interested in pursuing a project like this. We, at first we were kind of cynical or skeptical that we could pull something like this off. Uh, in that we didn't know if we'd really be able to give a contract to work on a game like this. So, yeah, so what makes you guys qualified to be able to pull this thing off? I mean, it's a very, you know, it seems like a specific or new genre, really, uh, and, you know, there's big competitors out there. What may, I mean, you make AAA games before. Why are you qualified, or do you have people that you, you've brought into the team that, you know, kind of rounded you guys out? Yeah, it's a lot of good questions there. Um, well, first of all, uh, even though, as a studio, we've traditionally made RPG, RPG games, uh, as, as developers and gamers internal to the studio, we have a lot of different fans of a lot of different genres. So, fighting games, shooters, uh, car games, uh, you name it, we've got here people here playing it. Um, you know, a lot of us were really kind of into the MOBA genre as well, as that was getting pretty big right around when we started Armored Warfare. What kind of past titles have people worked on, you know, beyond, beyond those role-playing games? I mean. Uh, as far as working on it, uh, we've had uh, a lot of developers join us from uh, games like Call of Duty um, and, and other uh, very high-profile FPSs of the in the war genre. Mm -hmm. um, we've had uh, developers join us from other MMO projects, um, Star Trek Online, and games like that. Um, so really, re rounding out your expertise on the on the market beyond just the core. Obsidian people that you had working here when you started the project. Yeah, the, our warfare team has grown significantly with new hires um, because we really identified, we knew where our strengths were in terms of number crunching, data analysis, uh, working on balance and things like that. But we also recognized we needed to make a back end platform, server architecture, databases, uh, really bring aboard an art team that could focus on realistic modern day environments. And so we did a lot of hiring to ramp up on all those areas to add to our specialties, and we've had, put together a fantastic team in that regard. Great. So that being said, you still do have a heritage of RPG games. Is that going to be something that's going to be more reflected in Armored Warfare as, as, we go as we go forward? I mean, is that something that you want Armored Warfare to have elements of as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things we've been focusing on is really getting the core game right, getting core progression in the right area. But we have a lot of designs on the table for how we're going to introduce more story elements to the game and really build upon kind of the character development that we started off with the dealers, introducing those characters, fleshing them out further, giving the players further interaction with them more than just interacting with the interface. Um, and also just really telling players the story of the world of Armored Warfare. How did the world get into this condition? What is going on in the world in this setting? And why is it working that way? Uh, so storytelling through mechanics like commanders, crews, bases, these type of elements are how you're going to bring that through? Yeah, in, in this type of game, especially in a game where players are going to be playing a lot of matches and, and enjoying the content uh, you know, in, in, over and over in different scenarios, we don't really want to rely on heavy dialogue or cutscenes like a, maybe a traditional RPG might. We really feel like looking for ways to let players who are interested in the narrative explore it and learn about it and even unlock narrative related content without forcing it on players that are just more interested in playing the core game. Where do you, you know, we've heard things like American bias, Russian bias sure. and such. How do you separate that and, and make sure that, you know, the game is the game? Yeah, so while we do have uh, developers here who are very into tanks and strong tank enthusiasts and have their favorite tank, they also appreciate the need for balance. So when it comes to figuring out how these vehicles go up against each other in the game, the first thing we figure out is what is the intended role and behavior of that vehicle versus other vehicles that maybe seem similar on the surface but aren't when it comes down to the stats. And then we use basically performance statistics and metrics. Um, you know, we're not really bringing biases to the table when it comes to evaluating the performance of these vehicles. Even if it's our favorite vehicle and it has to be reduced in power because it's a lot of control, we'll make those changes as necessary. Um, across the board, the goal is to have a balanced, fun game where players who play the vehicles as they're intended and designed and maximize their efficiency in the different roles are going to perform really well. And it doesn't come down to like figuring out which vehicles the developers have strong bias for and, and so, excelling. So, for example, if it's a you know a tier seven vehicle, you basically have an upper limit and a, and a lower limit of where that tank needs to fit in in a in a in a power standpoint, right? So you're just going to do what you need to to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, if it's, t for example, a tier 7 tank, that tank we really want to be, the players who are playing, playing that tank should enjoy playing a match, whether they're going up against tier 8s or other tier 7s or against tier 6s, which is approximately the power range we would expect that vehicle to have. So we'll always be looking at statistics, reports, charts. Uh, we get a lot of those pretty much every day that we're constantly evaluating to make sure that overall the vehicle's performing and that everyone has a fair chance in every vehicle. Here's another big one that people talk about a lot, and that's... Uh that's historical realism versus gameplay. I mean, where where does Obsidian fall on that for Armored Warfare? Yeah, that is a good question, and it's one that we actually discuss uh, with great frequency internally as well. Uh, we realize it's important to to sell that experience and that immersion of of being in a war zone in a powerful military vehicle, ha hearing the loud cannon, seeing the detail of the models, that being recreated as accurately as possible, getting a sense that you're actually there in that environment with the audio and the, and the weather that goes on. All that stuff is really important and we want to sell that as much as possible so that people feel like that's convincingly realistic. Um, on the other hand, we really want it to be a fun game. And you know, certain realities that restrict what we could or couldn't do with these vehicles would really take away from that experience from players. So almost every single element of the game has been a discussion point of do we skew towards realism on this uh, or do we need to maybe give it some balancing parameters or gameplay mechanics that would pull away from that. One big example of that would probably be the way that we've given the classes different mechanics and different abilities. Um, that's not really a real world thing. Uh, you know, you could anticipate in the real world uh, a main battle tank can almost do everything that almost any military vehicle could. That's how they were built. It's how they were designed. In a game, though, that doesn't really make for a very fun exchange and back and forth between the different vehicles. You want real distinctions between these. Yeah, we really want, when you jump into a light tank versus a tank destroyer versus an AFV, that for you, the experience is different. What you're doing in a match is different, and that you have the tools in order to facilitate what that role is really all about. So, again, that was, that was something where we, we discussed it for a lot and strayed from... Re hardcore realism would say, well, no, M M MBT could do things like designated target and things like that, even if AFV could. Again, for the sake of the gameplay, we felt, well, we're going to give these things to one class and not the other class so that it feels different when you play against that vehicle or you play as that vehicle in the match. Yeah, I think so that diversity like is really important. Smoke shells, targeting people. I mean, these are all things that you used in order to distinguish between those classes. And, and it, I think it also probably gives the player like a real sense of 
of playing something different. When they pick a different type of tank, they get a different experience. Absolutely, and that's something we're going to continue to evolve on. Um, we are constantly evaluating the current class me mechanics and where there's room to maybe improve or expand upon those. Uh, again, it really comes down to what is the role of this class and how do we make sure that they have the tools to do it? Do they have enough actions or tools or options in order to succeed in what they're supposed to do in the match? Mm -hmm. And if we identify there's more needed, then we'll continue to add more as well. Free-to-play games. I mean, that's kind of been a dirty word for quite a while in the game industry. But over, I would say, the last couple of years, there's been a lot of games that have, you know, reshaped that to a much more consumer-friendly um, way to publish a game. Where, where does Armored Warfare, you know, come in on that free-to-play model? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I've been a gamer all my life, so I've seen that transition of first free-to-play was introduced and players were understandably cautious or skeptical about what this was doing and was it was it a scam, was it honest? Um, but over the last few years, that's really changed. And I think free-to-play games have come a long ways. Nowadays, the best free-to-play games are all about player choice, um, how fast do you want to progress, and uh, what sort of visual elements do you want to bring to the game for yourself? And that's really what Armored Warfare is targeting as well. Can you give some examples? Yeah, for example, vehicle customization. How does your tank look? Do you want some custom decals? Do you want a custom paint scheme on it? Things like that would be monetized. Um, they wouldn't have any impact on how the vehicle performs in a match. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's really important to us that a free player or a paying player are an equal battlefield when it comes to the individual matches. Um, you know, it also comes down to speed of progression. If you want to play through the game faster, uh, and you're willing to pay, then that opportunity is there for people that are interested in that. For example, maybe a premium account or, or purchasing a premium vehicle that has a, a better credit earning capacity. Yeah, because there's a lot of people that just don't have as, as much time as, say, their friends and they want to stay up with them or whatever. So, you know, spending a little extra money to grind out a little faster is, is great for them. Yeah, it's wonderful flexibility. I mean, I've, I've really come to enjoy the free-to-play genre as it's evolved over the last few years. But you can, as a free, in Arbor Warfare, as a free-to-play player, a player that chooses not to pay, you can still get everything in the game through, through grinding? Every tank would be available. Uh, the maps that everyone's playing on, they'll all be available. So you'll see and experience the same opportunities that any player would have. All right, so so outside of premium tanks and such, uh, yeah. the, your, your rate of progression and, and, and such, you'll still be able to unlock all those tier you know, eight, nine, ten tanks with, you know, without any problems. Yeah, again, yeah, with the exception of the premium vehicles, uh, the, the rest of the vehicles will be completely available, they won't be locked to free players, mm -hmm. and any matches, modes, or experiences that we put in the game, we want to be available to everyone. Great. Obviously, there's a lot of work uh, going into making the game more compatible for lower-end machines. Um, uh, people that are in the tests have seen, uh, you know, a lot of uh, improving in frame rates and such. Uh, but what about those guys that are, are running the beast machines? I mean, when we talk about, you know, our audience here in, in America, uh, there are some people that have some really high-end machines that are just asking us on a daily basis, you know, I want I want something super cool. Where, where are you guys falling on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's something we talk about a lot and we definitely want to get to. Um, some of the cool things that we want to be able to do is, for example, really improving the way that trees are destroyed as vehicles interact with them so that you can actually shatter the trunks, um, having the wood flying everywhere and things like that. I think it would be really cool to see that in a match. Again, targeting a higher uh, end machine with that type of physics. Um, better destruction of the props in the environment and things like that, so a little bit less based on toggling states and more about dynamic destruction. Um, really want to improve like the weather effects and the interaction of the weather and environment with the vehicle itself. So you'll see mud build up on a vehicle or snow come to rest on a parked vehicle and things like that. Again, really targeting those extra details that a higher end machine can can show off. What about the, you know, how much can you do that in like, you know, high res textures or, or new lighting effects that, you know, let's talk about Windows 10 and DirectX 12. I mean, is are we going to be supporting those features? Yeah, we're always looking at new graphics options to support. I mean, one of the things we're definitely going to want to be able to, to convert over to at some point will be physics-based rendering, um, which is really a great way to show off shiny metal surfaces in a game. Um, that'll be something that we'll be wanting to get to as soon as possible. Cool. Um, Armored Warfare is also different in this genre in that it introduces something uh, that it's actually kind of seen in some role-playing games, you know, PVE. You know, you actually get to go and, and, and get into a party or a group of friends and, and go out there and bash on some computer bad guys. Yeah. Uh, can you, you tell me why that was introduced? Uh, what effect do you feel like it has to the general audience? You know, those type of things. 
Yeah, I mean, PvE, to a certain extent, because this is the first time that a game in this genre has uh, demonstrated it, it was really a big experiment in, in what is PvE in a game like this? What does it feel like? Um, and is it going to be fun? Is our players going to enjoy it? So far, I've been really happy with the start, the initial introduction of PvE that we've had so far. Um, you know, I feel like we're still just getting started. There's a lot more to introduce over time, a lot more uh, maps, match types, mechanics. Um, it, it, we, we talk a lot internally about some of our designs for, for boss fights. Yeah, we, um, already we, like to introduce. we already saw something like mini bosses. So now there's yeah. some guys are running around that have names on it and it's kind of fun to blow them up. <laughs> yeah, a little bit extra challenge on the levels. We want to continue expanding on that. Um, but no, PvE has been perceived extremely well and we really want to support it as every bit as much as we do PvP. Uh, we fully intend for you to be able to progress through the game, unlock the vehicles through PvE if that's your preference. Um, it started off as an experiment and, and trying to figure out what it feels like. Um, you know, we tried to imagine, you know, what would a platoon of, of vehicles be going into a region to do? Uh, and, you know, what are plausible scenarios that they could possibly execute? And really kind of use that to start structuring our, our mission ideas and, and, and our different levels. So, and it helps you, uh, it helps you tell your storyline a little bit better, right? You can get a little more personal on what's going on in the, in the world. Yeah, that's another thing that we really like about PBE is it's a great environment to start introducing characters, enemy factions, a little bit more history about what's going on, what's changed in the world from our modern timeline to the world of armored warfare. Things like that will definitely be introduced through PBE because it's a great place where we can do things like VO and have scripts and, and triggers and things like that that all introduce uh, additional story elements for players. Yeah, so, so do you see it as a... You said it was an experiment earlier, but now you see it as really an integral part of the game and a, and a separate progression path, or at least a, a crossover um, progression path where you can go back and forth between the two. Okay. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's important for us that a player who only plays one mode or the other, because that's their preference, is equally rewarded and able to progress through the game. Um, so that's something that we're constantly evaluating and iterating on, is hitting that sweet spot of where progression through PvE, if that's the mode a player prefers and that's the, what they enjoy playing the most, it'll be rewarding for them. For players that enjoy the competitive cutthroat nature of PvP, that's where they'll be rewarded and that's where they'll be able to progress. And for players who really just enjoy flip, flipping, flat, flipping back and forth between the two modes, based upon kind of what the mood they're in, or maybe they're on a losing streak and they want to go take it out on some bots, like anything like that, it's totally flexible enough to players to enjoy it however they prefer. All right, cool. New, new topic. Uh, a lot of people, especially when you, when you first see the game, a lot of people. It's it's obvious since we're in the same genre as other games before us that there'd be those those natural comparisons. Uh, can you describe like, you know, not only from a visual standpoint and 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 that we're in you know modern times, but what are some of the things that you really looked at to you know really make it armored warfare you know what what major changes have happened in the game that make you feel like this is your own game yeah that's a good question so i would really cite class mechanics as being a core element of that mm -hmm. um, looking at the vehicles that we had we were inspired by real world technology but then we were converting that real world technology into different realizations with for the different types of vehicles um, that's really something unique to armored warfare that you're not going to find uh, in other in other games in this genre in addition, we did bring online PvE, um, as we just discussed, and we recently revealed the first look at the initial stages of the base system, where mm -hmm. players will be able to build up their own base as a paramilitary contractor. And that's an individual base, right? Yeah, every player will have their own base that they'll be built to progress. Great. Um, can you go into any more depth on, like, at a mechanic that you saw, maybe uh, artillery is a good example of something that you felt like you wanted a specific thing for that class. I mean, break break down artillery and armored warfare and why the mechanics are what they are today. Yeah, that's a really good question. So artillery is one of those things that we spend a lot of time discussing and iterating on to really try and figure out what is the role of this specific class in our vehicle. And again, as I've been saying, it really comes down to every class needs to kind of offer something unique. And we knew that the thing about artillery, it's, it's pretty much understood that the convention for artillery is that it is long range, indirect fire, and not very good at close range uh, engagements. Um, and trying to build off of that in a way that's interesting for players to be in a match that have to deal with that, as well as the artillery player himself feeling like he's contributing to a match. How did you avoid the frustrations from a long, a long range shooter? Well, we, we evaluated the fact that the fact that an artillery can shoot you with, from behind a mountain or from behind a hill, basically they have this indirect long range shot power, which is really strong in a game like this. 
Um, we decided ultimately, if if the, if the shots, if the individual shots are not completely decisive in one shot, you know, in other words, too much alpha damage takes a vehicle out of the match out of out of nowhere. So we could tone that down. Uh, we could expand their splash damage radius so that it's a little bit more forgiving if they're missing their shots. They're still contributing. And then finally we looked at it and we, and we felt like what was really missing was for the targets to have a, an option for counterplay. Mm -hmm. Basically, you just, you know, before we really looked at it, you just got shot by artillery and you just took damage and you kind of didn't really know what to do about it. And other than trying to guess a good location to go hide and maybe not get shot, there wasn't a lot of back and forth between the target and the shooter in that case. Whereas you look at most engagements in a, in a game like this, and there is a lot of back and forth between angling your armor, using hard cover, taking advantage of the armor of your hull. There's a lot of exciting counterplay going on there that was missing from artillery. We decided that what really needed to go in was a warning for the target. Um, and so that was kind of how we balanced out. We thought, well, artillery could be more accurate, fire faster, do a little bit dam less damage per shot, but in exchange for all that, the targets have to be warned where they're coming at. And that gives the target a chance to evaluate on the spot, what do they need to do? Do they need to take cover? Do they need to keep moving? Do they need to stop moving? Um, you know, some of it's a little bit of guesswork, some of it's instinct, but I think you can really see players take advantage of that in a match as, as they really respond to the threat of artillery. How do you go about starting that process? You know, we have like 60 tanks in the game right now. How did you choose to get those ones in? Yeah, it's always been a really tough thing because there's so many vehicles that we want to get in and we can only make so many at a time. Uh, what we did is we decided that rather than going completely broad and global with every single vehicle or like getting a representative vehicle from every nation, um, we kind of concentrated on a few areas to start with. To get a sampling of vehicles, um, you can largely see from Russia, from North America, um, and from, from Germany being probably the, pro the prominent influences, um, and as well as vehicles from the United Kingdom. So we started with sort of those four nations to begin with. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to give each of those nations enough representative representation that we could represent those nations across multiple decades. Mm -hmm. So that sort of gave us our initial lineup of vehicles. Um, but from there, then you know we can want to continue branching out to other European nations, Eastern European nations, um, South American nations. We really like if it's been built, we want to put it in the game. And if, if the tank hasn't shown up yet, it's not because we don't want to get it in yet. It's it, it'll come along. Um, they just have to be built in order. And what do you do in certain situations when you have a tank that has like lots of different national variations? Because we have, you know, you have a lot of people out there and, you know, seeing, seeing a tank from their nation is important to them. Uh, even though it may already be in the game, there may be a, a, a version of it, like a, 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 a T-64 or so, that actually has a fairly significant uh, revision based on the nation. Yeah, uh, basically we do want to get those all in. Um, one of the things about our dealer tree system is it gives us a lot of flexibility of adding vehicles into different lines without requiring them to all be confined to a single location in player progression. So we can do something like that where we take an export T-72, uh, represent the visual changes that are unique to that export, and get it in somewhere else in the progression tree. So we'll definitely be doing that over time. Great. Um, let's talk about customization for a second. Uh, a lot of people, like, they look at their tanks that are currently in the game and they go, wow, these really look like they're fresh off the factory floor. Yeah. I mean, uh, is there, talk about customization, because people want to customize their stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, customization is going to be kind of one of our big next focuses coming up in the, in, in the next several updates uh, for Armored Warfare. Uh, we'll start off with some very simple things, decals and, and kind of, you know, custom placards and things like that that players can put on their vehicles. Uh, depending on what little personal touches they want. Um, but we really want to expand that. So I know players, you know, want, it, different players enjoy different levels of wear and tear on their vehicles. Some players really do want that very nicely kept looking vehicle. Maybe not fresh off the factory floor, but very well maintained, um, you know, cleaned after battles and things like that. That's kind of the starting point because it's very easy to start with a very nice clean vehicle and add those visual touches to it. So if you want to add dirt caking or, you know, dust from the battlefield or scrapes and scratches from where this thing has been deployed and seen action. We can add those things on top of a vehicle that starts off mostly in a clean state. It's a lot harder to take those things off when they're baked in uh, and give someone a clean vehicle. So you're talking about potentially adding things in that happened during the battle um, to the tank to make them look more worn. Will we, we ever have a, like a slider or something that can make my tank look less or more, more worn to start? Yeah, I mean, that's something that we basically use the same technology as something that changes in the match. 
mm -hmm. players who have a preference for how they want their vehicle to always look, mm -hmm. we would let them be able to configure that. I mean, so one of the th important things is when it comes to the look of a vehicle, almost everyone has their own personal preference. I mean, I like seeing the wear and tear. I like seeing the weathering and the in the environment. Other players prefer to see a really nice, crisp, clean-looking vehicle that looks like it's been, you know, just just recently washed. And as we introduce more mechanics to kind of give a lot of that diversity to the look of vehicles, we'll also give players control over that diversity so that for them, they see the way that they, they see the vehicles the way they want to. Great. And last, I just want to open up to you to you know to ask you, is there anything you want to let people know about your experience on working on Armored Warfare and and uh, you know why 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 should people give you, give the game a shot? One of the great things about Armored Warfare, and it's it's. I mean, it shouldn't surprise me because I've been doing this for a long time, but it really blows me away how awesome the community is. So the forums, the blogs, the YouTube videos, the Twitch streams, I'm always checking those out. I'm finding new things every day to watch and read and listen to or evaluate. And that people are so engaged in the game already so early in its lifeline is so, is so exciting. Um, and so one of the things about Armored Warfare is like it's got a great community. Like people should get engaged. They should get to know the other players. They should have fun with these players in the matches. It's also important to realize like we're very excited where Armored Warfare is right is at right now. More importantly, we're very very excited about where Armored Warfare is going in the future. So we have a lot of great features lined up, and it's really great to get on the ground floor of a game like this that's going to continue to grow over the years because you'll get to see all those things come in and understand how they're adding to the game that you've already been enjoying, something that you're already an expert at because you've been playing it, and now there's this new element to chew on. So the sooner you get involved in something like that that you know is going to continue to grow over the years, the better. Yeah. So this, is, this game's going to be out there for years and years, and you know. You know, open beta is just going to be the start of it, right? Yeah, I mean, for us, that's just the start point of the features. I mean, we, you know, we've, we're introducing a lot of these systems. We're we're letting players take a look at kind of where we're starting with them. But but everything is going to continue to grow. Everything is going to continue to evolve. Uh, we've got a lot of great plans lined up that we're really excited to show off with players. It's just going to they'll be coming out with pretty much regular content updates, regular feature updates, cool new things that we're going to be able to show off for players. And I think we've touched on a lot of them just as we've been talking. All right, I'm going to cut you off there because we want to save some questions for you know our next uh, interview. So we hope to see you soon. Uh, this is Joshua Morris and Rich Taylor here at Obsidian Studios. We'll see you next time. So there you have it, a nice little interview of Richard Taylor, Project Director of Armored Warfare from Obsidian by Joshua Morse, Senior Producer at My.com for Armored Warfare. I am Spooky from Armored Talk, and if you're not familiar with the website, check us out at armoredtalk.com. You will find a lot of information about Armored Warfare and some real-life armor thrown in. Hope to see you soon. Everybody have a good day or good night, wherever you are.